hey you guys, here is a quick summary video for AQA Biology Organisation. Now if you want a key knowledge list, keywords and loads and loads more stuff, you can get that in your free revision guide which is over on my website or you can get that from Amazon. You need to know the difference between a tissue, an organ and an organ system. A tissue is one type of cell carrying out one function. An organ is made up from lots of different types of cells carrying out a joint function. And an organ system are a group of organs that work together to carry out a function. So our hierarchy is cells, tissues, organs, organ systems. For example, we can have muscle cells, which are part of muscle tissue, which together contract, which form part of the stomach, churning food, and this forms part of the digestive system. Here we have an overview of our digestive system. The mouth, which is mechanically going to break down food. The salivary gland, which is going to produce amylase. The liver, which produces bile. Bile is something that emulsifies fat, so increases the surface area of fats, turning them from a big blob into a small blob and neutralises stomach acid. The gallbladder that stores bile. The small intestine that moves glucose, ions and other things into the blood and has a very large surface area. The stomach which turns up food, the stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, kills bacteria. And it provides an environment for proteases to work. Your pancreas which produces enzymes. Your large intestine which removes excess water. And your rectum and anus which gets rid of waste food. There are a number of different enzymes in the digestive system that you need to be aware of. Lipase breaks down fats into fatty acids and glycerol. It is made in the pancreas and small intestine and works in the small intestine. Protease breaks down proteins into amino acids. It is made in the stomach, pancreas, and small intestine, and works in the stomach and small intestine. Amylase breaks down starch into sugars. It is made in the salivary glands, pancreas, and small intestine. And it works in the mouth and small intestine. Amylase, protease and lipase are all enzymes and work with the LEC and key mechanism. We have our enzyme which has a very specifically shaped active site. So only one substrate or a couple of substrates are going to fit in there, the ones that have the complementary site. They're going to form an enzyme substrate complex and then the enzyme is either going to break apart things or it is going to join together things. It is then going to release the products and then the enzyme is unchanged and can be used again. You need to know how and temperature affects enzyme activity and it is this kind of lopsided curve. When we have really, really low temperatures, there is not enough energy. At a peak, this is the optimal temperature. And then after the peak, the enzymes get denatured. Which means the links between them holding everything together are being destroyed. The enzyme is not killed. I know the temptation is to say this, but the correct term is denatured. Our curve for pH is much more symmetrical. We still have an optimal pH, 
but when it is too high or too low, the bonds aren't going to be in place. So the active site of the enzyme is going to be broken down. So again, it's going to be denatured. Here we have our respiratory system. Air goes in through the mouth or the nose, down into the trachea, which is also known as the windpipe. Then into the bronchus, which is a branch of the trachea. Into the bronchioli, which is a branch of the bronchus. And into the little grape or cauliflower shaped alveoli. This is where gas exchange happens. And they have an incredibly large surface area. Your diaphragm moves up and down to bring air in and out. The heart pumps blood around the body. The intercostal muscles allow the rib cage to expand. And the ribs, the last part that makes up everything, protects the lungs. Here we have the cardiovascular system and it is a double system. The blood gets pumped from the heart to the lungs, goes back to the heart and then gets pumped around the rest of the body. If you see a picture of the heart, the first thing you do is write right and left on there. We have our vena cava where the blood enters. It goes into the right atrium down through a valve into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it goes up and to the lungs via the pulmonary artery. It comes back into the heart via the pulmonary vein, into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then is pumped to the rest of the body via the aorta. If you want to check you have the path of blood right, then we need to be looking at capital letters. It goes through the vena cava, the atrium, the ventricle, then the artery, back through the vein, into the atrium, to the ventricle, and then the aorta. So it goes vena cava, atrium, ventricle, artery, vein, atrium, ventricle, aorta, V-A-V-A-V-A. -A -A -A. If you don't have that pattern, you've made a mistake somewhere. Other features of the heart that you need to know are here. These are valves. They will only allow blood to flow. And that this side has a much larger muscle than this side. The right side only needs to pump blood to the lungs, which aren't very far away. But this side has to pump blood to the rest of the body, a much longer distance. The majority of the time, veins carry deoxygenated blood apart from the pulmonary vein, which carries oxygenated blood back into the heart. And the majority of the time, um, arteries carry oxygenated blood apart from the pulmonary vein, which carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. If the heart isn't functioning properly, pacemakers, artificial pacemakers, can be introduced to help the heart keep time. Or if somebody has cardiovascular disease, then these tubes can get blocked up. Arteries have a very thick walls because they are carrying blood under high pressure, which means they have a thin lumen. That's the gap in the middle. Capillaries are very, very small. They are only one cell thick or very very thin I should say they are only one cell thick this is to allow for diffusion they generally go around in this kind of like mesh network around things like the gut around the villi in the gut around the alveoli in the lungs so they have a large surface area the veins carry deoxygenated blood they carry it back to the heart so they have valves and they have thin walls and a thick lumen because they're carrying blood under low pressure. Blood is made up of several components. The actual colour of blood is this pale yellow colour. This is the serum, that's the liquid component of the blood. The cells give it its actual colour. Red blood cells, the cells that give blood its colour, have no nuclei. And this is so they have more space to carry 
oxygen, which is their main function. White blood cells are part of the immune system. And platelets are fragments of cells and they are important for things like clotting. When we have cardiovascular disease, we have fatty deposits. building up in the coronary arteries, the arteries around the heart. This can lead to the formation of blood clots. This blood clot can block an artery. This is going to restrict the oxygen. To some cells. These cells are then going to die. If too many cells die, this can then lead to a heart attack. If so many cells die that the heart can't function properly or can't pump blood properly. Risk factors for this are going to be smoking, high blood pressure, or having too much salt or fat in your diet. Health is a complicated concept. It is going to be your overall state of physical and mental well-being. This is going to be affected by a number of things. It is going to be affected by your diet, exercise, community, whether you feel lonely, whether you have friends, and in part, by your genes. Epidemiology studies are going to be looking at the levels of health and illness in a population. We need to do it in a wide population, so we can look for different risk factors. For example, we can't force people, we can't ask people to eat a high fat diet or to do lots of exercise or to drink lots so we can compare them to other people who don't do those things or do do those things. But there are people within a wide population that do do those things already. So if we wanted to look at the effect of exercise on health, we could take our population, we could look at people that do lots of exercise and compare them to people that didn't do any exercise. And because we have such a large population of people we're looking at, then we can compare the two groups. And we can follow these groups for years and years to see what the effects are going to be. Cancer is when cells begin to divide uncontrollably. This is going to lead to lumps, which for most people, some people, is the first sign that something is wrong. And these lumps can be divided into two groups, benign tumours and malignant tumours. Benign tumours are slow and are generally harmless. Things like warts or moles are benign tumours. And having a lump on your skin generally doesn't do you much damage. The problem is when there are malignant tumours. These are fast growing, they are aggressive, and they are mobile. So I don't mean the wart on your arm or the mole on your arm is going to get up and start moving around. I mean cells are going to move throughout your body. 
Cells from the initial lump are going to jump into the bloodstream, move somewhere else, and they could set up tumours, lumps in other places. And while a lump on your skin generally won't do you much damage, a lump in your brain, a lump in your liver, or a lump in your lungs can do you quite a lot of damage. There are a lot of risk factors involved in cancer, and there are a lot of things that we're in control of. Smoking has large implications in lung cancer. Diet, a good diet, can reduce your risk of bowel cancer, whereas if you don't eat much fruit and vegetables, then you are putting your bowel um, at risk of cancer. The amount of time you spend in the sun can affect your susceptibility to skin cancer. And unprotected sex can leave you at risk of cervical cancer. Here we have a cross-section of a typical leaf. Our palisade mesophyll, where photosynthesis is going to take place. Cuticle, which is the waxy layer. Upper and lower epidermis, which cover the plant. Spongy mesophyll, which is a space for gas exchange. And the guard cell and stomata, which is where transpiration takes place. Inside the plant, we have the xylem and the phloem. The phloem is going to carry... Water, this is generally going to be an upwards direction from the roots where it is collected to the leaves where it can be used for photosynthesis and the phloem which carries ions and food and this is generally in a downwards direction from the leaf where food can be made in photosynthesis to the roots where it can be stored in, for example, potatoes. There are several factors that affect the rate of transpiration and transpiration not only involves water uh, moving out of the stomata but also moving up through the xylem. So if we have bright light that is going to lead to more transpiration. More light means more photosynthesis, which means there's going to need to be more water brought up into the cell. If we have a high temperature, that is going to lead to more transpiration. Because the rate of reaction is going to happen faster. If we have high wind... That is going to lead to more transpiration. Because wind is going to be um, brushing against the leaf or flowing against the leaf, moving things out of the way, so diffusion is going to play a part here. And if we have high humidity, this is going to lead to lower transpiration. Water is going to struggle to leave the leaf because there is a very high concentration of water, it's very humid outside.